Welcome to the International Teacher Podcast with your host, Matt the Family Guy, Kent the Cat Guy, Jacqueline from JP Mint, and Greg the Single Guy, bringing you episodes from around the world about the best kept secret in education. You've got it, international teaching. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the international... <laughs> come on. Welcome to the international teacher... Her. Oh, come on. <laughs> you so mean. And you know what? He's probably going to keep this in. Ah. Oh. Okay, good. Welcome to the International Teacher Podcast. I'm Jacqueline from JP Mint, and I'm joined by Greg the Single Guy. Hi, Greg. Hello. Hey, JP. How are you? Hey, Greg. We have Jeff from, well, from the United States, but calling us in all the way from Brazil. Um, Hi, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone today? I'm great. Got my coffee, as you can tell, because my energy level is through the roof. <laughs> normally, yeah, morning I'm, for you guys, evening for me. Normally, I'm, I'm recording this at night, so I'm like, oh, very, but <laughs> it's morning. Hey, Greg, JP, we're on um, this side of the pond today. Yeah, Kent is not here this evening for us evening because he is working on his uh, grades and stuff towards the end of the year here. If he happens along... Of course, we'll open have open arms for him to join us, and we're hoping for that. But that's the reason he's not with us tonight. Yeah, it's that time of year. Jeff, did you get your comments and grades in yet? Um, we have comments due in a couple of weeks, and I had to change some grades yesterday for our seniors. So, yeah, it was a normal time of the year, right? So uh, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure, Greg, Jeff and I know each other. We've known each other, um, I'm trying to think. I think it was like 2014. 2014 okay. Yeah, so 2014, I think we met at the PTC. Remember, we talked about the Principal Training Center in London. They also have one in Miami. And so Jeff and I met. We took the same course, right, Jeff? So we were at yeah, probably the same table a couple times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we were there twice together, weren't we? Stuart. And, yeah, uh, Stuart Andrew from and Switzerland. And yeah, Andrew oh, Andrew Norway. from. what? Yeah. He was up north. Where he was, was he? He's in Norway. He's in Oslo. Norway. Or, south, north yeah. Of Oslo, yeah, so. yeah, so the four of us would go out for beers afterwards and, and hang out. And, uh, and Jeff and I have stayed in contact all this time. I've eagerly followed his career. And when he moved to Brazil, I was so happy for him because we're going to hear he's a long-term veteran international teacher just like us. So, Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into teaching? Oh, yeah, sure. Um... I don't know, I kind of look at different stories, but when I was in university, the first, first time at university, I, I was studying to be an elementary teacher, um, but then I ended up dropping out of college, mostly because of uh, boredom and financial issues, and joined the Air Force, went to Japan, and in Japan I actually met, uh, I was in a little small town in northern Japan, I met a couple of teachers just walking down the street who were at the American school in Japan, and that kind of laid the groundwork for just the idea. I didn't really know anything to teach overseas. So uh, so when I got out of the Air Force, I went back to college. And then after graduating, I went to Japan to teach English. Uh, I was on the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program for three years in Japan. And so that kind of, that's where I got started. Since then, I, I kind of always wanted to remain overseas, but you know the two-year rule. So I had to, I ended up teaching in the States for a couple of years. 2001, I moved to Beijing and it's... Uh, non-stop since then so okay so i just want to find out where from because i kind of greg can you detect a little bit of a southern accent i want to sort of clarify where no no southern accent. not really no maybe you canadians can hear it but <laughs> i can't really southern where are you Ontario, from jeff uh, i'm from tennessee so well come on tennessee is south <laughs> when you mention Isn't southern it? accent it'll come out yeah so yeah <laughs> what's the plural of y'all ewans ewans is the plural ewans yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard in Texas they say all y'alls. All y'alls sometimes, but Texans are weird. They 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 don't claim to be Southern sometimes. They're like, oh, we're well, Western. they're just from Texas, yeah. Texas yeah. and the rest of the world. <laughs> Tennessee, okay. That's Smoky Mountain. Smoky Mountains, yeah. I'm, I'm mm. literally from the Smoky Mountain area, so uh, mm. I have a Dolly. I should have worn my Dollywood shirt today. Uh, it would have been, uh, been perfect. <laughs> 
Oh, and Memphis. That's also Graceland. I haven't been. Is it worth it? <laughs> uh, I have. I've been across the street from Graceland. There's um, a Kentucky Fried Chicken across the street from Graceland. So I, I had chicken there one night when I was driving to Texas. That's as close as I got. I had a friend who worked at Graceland. He he talked about it a lot. So isn't it true, Greg? We always we never go. We never go where we're from. Like we never go visit stuff. Not unless somebody visits you. Then you take them around where you are, and then it's yeah. more exciting somebody else's eyes but i just can't get this whole kfc across from graceland <laughs> they must be sick of people going in and go i'll have a bucket of chicken oh, thank you very much. <laughs> i've also there's also a kfc at the foot of the great wall of china so kfc is um they're really smart company. oh they put my their... gosh at the bottom of carlsbad caverns they okay, had wow. one down in new mexico they had one at the, I think there's a KFC right at the base of the pyramids in Egypt and Cairo, is. One of the which best is views. ridiculous. One of the best views of the pyramids right? oh. at, at from KFC. Yeah, so. yeah, but you're looking at the view of the Sphinx <laughs> and you've got the, yeah. was, the pyramids and then you have KFC. And you smell it's the like, lovely what? chicken. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> they are everywhere. When I was living in Shanghai, and, uh, more KFC stories, uh, they had they started <laughs> introducing egg tarts, the, the Portuguese egg tarts, really popular in China, and KFC started selling them. And everyone, all my Chinese friends, were like, they have the best egg tarts in all of China. <laughs> so they'd always go to KFC just for the egg tarts. So, so they really figured it out. The International Teacher Podcast he is brought to you today by KFC, <laughs> unofficially KFC, Sponsored. brought to you everywhere around yes, the world. It's everywhere you want to be. Well, it's where I ate, finally, in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. I was there in Fukuoka for a 12-hour visit, uh, no, visa run mm -hmm. from Pusan. I took the hydro, what is that thing? Hydro hydrofoil hy hydrocraft? Yeah, yeah. Hydrofoil, that's it. The, I took the hydrofoil the vehicle, from the Pusan yeah, to Fukuoka. It's, it's fast. It's super fast. And then I got there, and I really wanted Japanese food. I walked around. This was the 90s, and at that time... They didn't have like big signs on the outside or, or in Korea, you would have like little dancing pigs on the windows so you'd know, oh, that's a pork restaurant. But there I didn't speak Japanese, didn't read Japanese. And I was walking into dentist office, hair salons, cause they don't have the window pane. They just have like a door. So you're just walking into random places and I was looking for food, couldn't find any. I ended up going to KFC at the stadium cause that was the only thing I could find. It was so sad. You're like, I'll have a bucket of chicken. Um, they're like, no, but we can give you a root canal. And you're like, no, thank you. I need the chicken, man. I need the chicken. I had a root, I had a root canal in Our, Japan, actually, and so uh, I can tell you the chicken's better. <laughs> uh, Jacqueline, did you live in Korea as well? Yeah, yeah. I was in Korea for three years. Oh, I, was, I, was I was in Busan. Seoul. I lived in Busan, yeah. So um, I lived in Busan for a year, and I was at a Hagwon uh, Academy there. So I was in Seoul uh, for two years. Yeah, okay. that's where I started my my Hagwon career, and then no, sorry, I say two years. I was there one year in Puchon, just mm -hmm. outside of Seoul, and then okay. I went home and get this. I got my job from a newspaper in Seattle. Oh, yeah, you get on the good. internet in 1997. Oh. They did have this like conglomeration of newspaper ads, and I found an ad in Seattle, Washington's mm -hmm. newspaper, asking for English teachers at the college level. So I applied, and because I had one year already under my belt, they hired me instantly. I went back to Taegu, just uh, north of Pusan. Mm -hmm. And I was there for two years. Yeah, my, uh, you... I have a question. Go ahead, Greg. All right. Uh, listen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, appreciate that, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Hey, listen, I want to scoot back a little bit here. Uh, yeah. Let's talk, Jeff. We're going to talk a little bit about your international teaching career. Sure. And you mentioned that you started off in China. And can you go a little bit more in depth into yeah, that? Sure. You um, had heard about international teaching in Japan and you started where and what was it around 2000? Yeah, I did, I, did, uh, I did five years of ESL in Japan and Korea, and then I was teaching in the States. I did my a master's in Tennessee, and then I went, ended, up in, ended up in Boston teaching in the year for the public schools there. Had a lot of friends there. Um, it was such a bad experience that, you know, I used my planning periods uh, to look for jobs overseas. <laughs> And I ended up, I was looking for an ESL job again because I thought oh, I'm probably not going to, I don't, I did ISS at one point, ISS search, I was at International Services uh, in 99, but it was before I had my two years experience. And so I was completely ignored by, and the people are like, we don't need you, we don't want you, right? So, um, <laughs> and they said things like ESL is not real teaching, which I now realize it's, it is real teaching, but it's, it's very different than what we do, right? So, um, 
Uh, but I found a job at one of the ESL sites for looking for a history and an English teacher in Beijing at a small school. Um, it's, it's called a New School of Collaborative Learning, uh, which I always like the name. I did a series of interviews with them online, and I think I had to do a cert I had to send things like my mail to like the interview, and we did a phone call, uh, and that's how I got my start. I spent two years there, small. I mean, about 80 kids, K through 12. We ended up. Wow. I think the school, I, I left, I mean, I was leaving before, but Ebola hit, uh, they had the Ebola outbreak in China, and we lost, I think we lost about 75% of our kids. We, we were down to about 20 kids, everyone's left the country, so this school, unfortunately, went out of business a couple years after I left. But then I was, I got back into the whole idea of using search or ISS, so search, I think it was 2002 or three. I can't remember if it was over January 1st, but 2002, they had a December fair in Kuala Lumpur, and so I went down for that. Didn't get a job there, but then I was also invited to the London IB Fair, and, and that was kind of at the time when IB was the big buzzword, you know, in education. So I thought, I want to go. Did you have IB experience to get into that fair? I didn't. I didn't. I was really surprised I got oh, into it. Uh -huh. Yeah, I wrote, and they said, oh, yeah, come to London. You know, and I ended up getting a job there. when I, I interviewed for a few jobs there, and I, I got a job in Kuwait, AIS Kuwait. Uh, it was sort of different with IB, and, and for our listeners that maybe don't know, the International Baccalaureate is is a tough thing to get into mm -hmm. unless you have experience. It's one of those catch-22s. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll find a school that's willing to hire you without any experience because they really do need it. It's the right time or you get the right timing, and you get hired on, and then they train you or send you to training. Yeah. However, like Jeff, you got a job with an IB school, and then they probably trained you because it's it's not easy to get a job without IB training right, yeah, for those IB like schools. AIS, I don't know if they still do it. I mean, I, I still have a lot of friends there, but Kuwait, you know, the golf uh, is not always everyone's first choice. I mean, you, historically, a lot of people think a place like that, oh, it's just too hot or too boring, whatever, but they were willing to train. They kind of recruited on that. They were like, we're, they were starting MYP, middle years program, when I, when I first arrived there. So I did a year or two of that, and then... What year was that? That was 2003. So, I mean, IB was okay. old then, but it was still kind of, I guess, getting more popular. And then the high school principal, he and I used to hang out and stuff on Fridays, and he wanted me to teach TOK my second year there, Theory of Knowledge. So then they sent me to training in the summer, and, and then really, I, then I taught IB philosophy there. We kind of had an IB history course, which is for the non-IB students, I taught that. And so, yeah, they, they, it was a good school. Jeff, can I ask, what was your degree, or what is your degree in, your original BA? Uh, I have my original degree is in history. I got a BA in history. Mm. And then I have my master's in curriculum and instruction. So so that's that's one of the reasons why you would be kind of led into the history realm, yeah, right? Yeah. Because that's, Greg, you know, a lot of schools will actually be restricted to whatever your degree is. Um, there are certain countries where they only allow a work visa if you have the degree in what you're teaching. So that's why I was kind of curious uh, if Kuwait was one of those countries. I'm not sure because we had a it was we had a lot of teachers there. They hired a lot of like Lebanese teachers and Egyptian teachers, and many of them didn't have a degree from like the Western University. But the school was paying professional development money to help them, like College of New Jersey and things like that. So. I felt, you know, from a PD perspective for new teachers, it was a really great school. Because, I mean, they helped me get a lot of IB training. It completely helped me in the rest of my career. Uh, but I know a lot of the teachers who were there also got that initial Western style education uh, or a master's degree from College of New Jersey or another school like that. And they were very supportive of that. Uh, even though, I mean, a lot of people could say complain about schools sometimes. I thought they went over the top to help new teachers. So My experience in Kuwait was the same. And a lot of schools do offer the master's program for education as a satellite. Mm -hmm. So if you're a listener that's not familiar with it, there's schools like you said, New Jersey. I think College of New Jersey. I think Michigan State might have come as well. Like it's some, they actually, I think they came to Kuwait as a, as a satellite campus, mm -hmm. but I didn't take part of that. So, yep. And then I did Framingham mm -hmm. and there's about two or three others that sent, they set up cohorts at the school. Maybe it's changed now with online and everything, but at the time, my experience was they would uh, bring in somebody for 10 days mm. at a time, and they would we would do an entire course in 10 days in the evenings. I ended up getting a master's that way. I call it a Mickey Mouse master's, but it looks good on paper. It works, yeah. And, I mean, I learned quite a bit, but there's not a whole lot to do in Kuwait. I was at the uh, Dasman Model School back in the day. Okay. I always said to myself, God, I wish I was at that other school 
right? I felt like it was the little redheaded stepchild mm. of uh, ASK, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. That was a long time ago. I was there from 2005 to 2007. I put in my okay. two years oh, we're there. We're in Kuwait. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. And there's not a whole lot to do there except you... look at camels, <laughs> go shopping, and do a master's maybe. I, I don't know. I, I kind of, I'm not going to completely disagree with you because a lot of people say it's a boring place, whatnot. Um, but I loved living near the Gulf. Like I was in Salmia, which is AIS was right there. I mean, I could literally almost every night I would go walk along the Gulf. You know, and the Corniche was maybe five five miles long, or you know, seven or eight kilometers long. And so for I think it it kind of trains you, I guess, in some ways to just live life better. I don't. Know, for me, it, it's put me in a different frame of mind, but. But yeah, we'd always go out with friends. I mean, going to dinner with friends was, that was like the number one thing in life. Uh, going to breakfast on Friday mornings and things like that. So, uh, mm. uh, but I felt, as, I felt in that perspective, there's a real sense of community in the school. And I, I kind of felt the same way in Cairo and I was at Cairo American College. I think a lot of people feel like they're so isolated, but the school community is really tight knit. So uh, you're talking about Kuwait and then you're talking about Egypt. When did you? So how long did you spend in Kuwait then? You I was in two Kuwait for six in years. No, I stayed six. I know I was... The, like I said, six years? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have friends who've been there mm-hmm. since the 90s, you know, so, uh, or even one woman from the 80s. Yeah, I went to Kuwait. I was there for six years, and then I ended up... It's, I was thinking about it the other day. I, I ended up hanging out one... The, between the summer, my first and second year, I came back a little early from vacation. We had, a, we had these long vacations in the summer. I think it was like two and a half months, three months, uh, which was really mm-hmm. nice, but... You know, you don't want to stay in Kuwait because, you know, it's so hot. It's uh, 50, 55 degrees mm. Celsius, something like that. 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I came back a little early to, um, I was going to go to India. I had a ticket and everything booked, and I was going to go to India and go to the mountains. But after my time in the States and Europe, I was so exhausted, I just decided to stay in Kuwait for about three weeks in August, which is oh, so hot. But uh, the librarian <laughs> was there all summer. He, his wife was one of the principals, and he was getting everything organized. And so he and I used to hang out and just play chess and stuff, and... Uh, we'd go to the pool hall and play things like that. But he actually became an assistant principal later in Shanghai at Shanghai Community International School. And he wrote me, I think my fifth year in Kuwait, he's like, we have an opening for history and economics. He said, can you teach economics? And I'm like, and of course, the answer you always give in international education is like, oh, yeah, of course, of course I teach economics. <laughs> but like, I've literally never, I've never had a course in economics. Um, and I, I've studied, I studied it when I did, when I did graduates uh, graduate review, I had to, or no, I did foreign service exam. I remember I had to study the guns and butter micro macroeconomics. So I did a little study, but um, but yeah, I said yeah, sure, why not? Put me in diploma economics, and so uh, so that was a tough first couple of years learning the course, but it was really good. So I'm, wait a second. So did you from Kuwait? Did you go to Shanghai? Yeah, then? when Sh- in Kuwait, I went to Shanghai for the next five years. So, but that was only because of the con- <laughs> I always say it's probably because I didn't go to India that summer. It was just kind of that connection we made. We became really good friends, and then he became an assistant principal, and he just had an opening. So as you say, it's a really small school system we, we work for. So but, uh, did did you work? Yeah, did you work for him, like assistant principal in the secondary then? He was the assistant for, the, he was there, I guess he was assistant for two years. His wife was a principal in the elementary. And then the next, mm-hmm. my second year, I don't want to give you too many details, but we had some kind of a scandal at the school. The principal ended up resigning. Mm. The assistant principal, though, we moved into facilities. He was actually really good with... We had a, three different campuses, so he was the facilities manager in charge of everything. So he did that for a while, and then... I don't Where did he go after that? I can't he went to Pakistan after that, I believe. But yeah, so I went there to teach economics and TOK and other classes. Yeah, it was good. It was that nice little connection we made, and he's still a good friend of mine today. So is it was it one of those things where you are learning a week before you're st- teaching your students, <laughs> you know, like, no, okay, I'm going to have to teach this. So I, I, I read the book and everything ahead of time. Like, um, like uh, <laughs> a, my, a friend of mine, and a, the guy who was actually teaching economics in Kuwait at the time, he's now in, um, I think he's in Singapore, American School in Singapore. He was very helpful. He shared all his notes and stuff with me. He gave me all the mm-hmm. slides. And so I just kind of went through it and taught myself economics. Even today, though, I, there's like, there's some higher level topics I'll, I'll be listening to, like theory of the firm or something. I'm like, Oh, I got to refer to the material again. I always say yes when they offer me things. Like you know, they offer me psychology one year. I'm like, oh, I, I'm not good at psychology, but yeah, sure, why not? It's on my resume now. And then when I came here, they said you're going to teach IB history, IB economics, or IB global politics. And we don't know which two, but you know, we're working on the schedule. I'm like, cool. They're like, have you done politics before? And I'm like, no, but it's my minor in high, you know, my minor in college is politics. So I'm like, 
Yeah, why not? It's a new opportunity. It's something else for the resume. So yeah, I always say just international schools, you kind of just, it's always good to say yes to things mm. and take a new experience because in the States, you don't often get those opportunities. I remember when I was teaching in Tennessee, I was teaching like ninth grade history and there was a, a 12th grade like American history, AP US history class. And they're like, well, when that guy retires, like in 15 years, <laughs> maybe you can have his job because it was literally that he has that job for till he's 35 for years of work. Mm-hmm. So you don't really get the same opportunities, but yeah, internationally, I think it's, it's been really great. What do you want to teach? You want to do TOK? Hey, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, uh, you want to teach math? <laughs> why not? Sure, why not? Uh, no, I can't do math. Jeff, I think there's an opening for a pre-kinder <laughs> afternoon sure, yeah, yeah. In, in our school. What do you think? Sure, why not? Uh, no, no. It's a joke. We don't, we don't have one. I actually... Um, I did my, when I taught in the academy in Korea, it was mostly K through six. Oh my gosh. I, I realized at that point I would never be an elementary school teacher because the energy level, those kids, I was just like. I knew it. That's my point. You're, you're, a, you're a secondary teacher. <laughs> I, I will say no. I will say no to some things, but uh, boy, that, I, mean, I did it. I did it for it a while. It was like but, herding um, cats. Right? I was going to challenge your over say yes thing. Yes, I do have limit. I guess I do have limit. But I've done it. So now I don't have to do it anymore. So. I said yes at one point. Got it. Yes. Well, everybody has their wheelhouse, and it does start sort of with age limits and where yours go, right? Both of you have that kind of a, a age limit, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Are we all secondary teachers? Um, nope. Greg is elementary. No, in fact, Kent and I both teach elementary, and I have for mo- most of my time. I've done technology as a specialist across the board, even for adults and stuff, but you two are mainly secondary. Kent and I are both elementary by trade. Mm. Yeah. But I also did the okay. uh, K, oh my gosh, I think it was K to 12, although it was a hog one, so it was after school. But from 4 p.m., mm. 3 p.m. to 10 p.m., I did the English Language Center in okay. Korea, and that mm. was K to 12. So you started off with the early kids, uh, you know, the kids get out of school really early if they're little tiny ones, and almost in diapers and you start teaching them English and then you go all the way through 9 p.m. were the grade 10, 11, 12 kids because by that time they'd gone through their math lessons, their, you know, geography lessons, whatever, and then they got to English at 9 p.m. and then you're teaching grade 10, 11, 12. But I wanted to go back. I wanted to, first of all, clarify because I don't want to send out a letter of apology to all ESL teachers. Because you did say something about ESL isn't considered real teaching, but this is what I wanted to clarify, and I wanted to give you a chance to clarify. What you were talking about there is what I'm talking about, like the hogwan, right? So when CV, like hiring departments, so heads of school, HR, when they see a hogwan or a language school on a CV, that's what they're not counting towards this sort of K to 12 experience. But you are not talking about ESL in a K to 12 international school. That is real teaching. Yeah. I think there's real teaching in both. I mean, I say that when I did the interview, I did. Um, yeah. I, says, I had a couple of interviews, but a lot of people just turned me down. Mm-hmm. They're like, no, we don't count. It was 99. It was 1999. Things have changed, maybe 25 years. But they're like, no, we don't count any of that time of ESL uh, as real teaching. And I'm like, OK, thanks. Um, it felt like real teaching when I was doing it, <laughs> but uh, now now it feels a lot different, right? I was mostly an assistant language teacher. Like you say, I was in Korea, I was, I was singing songs like, I like spaghetti, I like spaghetti, I was just like, I like pizza, um, which a lot of people do. I mean, I, I, I do a, um, I work a lot with elementary teachers, you know, we have a, a Big Buddies, Little Buddies program between ninth graders and first graders, and so we go over once a month and work with them and stuff, and there's a lot of that. I like spaghetti. I, I like singing and stuff like that. But uh, but I also work a lot with ESL teachers here because we have um, we have a lot of kids with uh, L- our learn- learning support and also English language instruction. So so yes. Yeah, so I know I'm not disparaging ESL teachers. Yeah. So to clarify, it wasn't the subject. It was the area you were teaching it in. So the fact that you know this 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. is is not considered well, quote unquote a real school or a real job it's a re- and a lot of those are backpackers yeah. they yeah. come in they do one two years yeah i mean i'm really glad the i mean for me i wouldn't be probably wouldn't be a teacher today with or teaching internationally without esal i mean if it weren't for the jet program or like academy i thought in mm-hmm. hogwan it would be um i'd have a very different life i'm sure but um and i really in those great experiences i mean i talk to young like i have a lot of i talk to students sometimes seniors who are trying to think about their future 
I'm like, you might want to consider doing a year or two in Japan or Korea or China. I mean, because their jobs are available. They are, they can be satisfying. Uh, the experience itself is great. And, um, and you, you know, it takes you out of your comfort zone. And you might, you also can see you really want to be a teacher because it's kind of, there's, there's similar aspects to it, especially like dealing with young people. I mean, that's one of the hardest parts of teaching, right? Dealing with emotional issues and things like that. And if you can do it in the ESL capacity, you can do it in, in math or science, whatever. So. Yeah, it's teaching light, <laughs> L-I-T-E. I, I went over to Korea because I wasn't ready for that, um, whatever, you know, seven to four, eight to four, uh, 30 Canadians in a classroom. I was not ready as a teacher to go into that situation. So I headed overseas, went to, uh, found a job in Korea, and then that was just eye-opening. Like the world opened yeah. up to me. I met international teachers at Seoul Foreign, uh, Seoul Foreign School and, and KIS maybe was at, uh, open in the 90s as well. And I was like, wait, what are you guys doing? Wait, you're doing something completely different from me. Like I'm, I'm waking up at 2 p.m., going to my work from 3 to 10 and then partying all night. But you're, you're wait, you're uh -huh. going from 8 to 4 in a regular school? Like that's how I discovered international teaching. And they had yeah. amazing packages. I mean... I was getting paid well, I felt, but the these were off the charts uh, salaries for the 90s. Yeah. And that's what got me uh, on the path. So you're right. ESL is a great open, like a door opener to the international circuit eventually. Because you, I mean, you mostly are living like a local in those situations. I mean, you have a local apartment, your neighbors are Korean or Japanese, you know, you, so you actually have to adapt a lot more Whereas I know a lot of international schools, you're somewhat insulated, not completely, but you're somewhat insulated from, you've got the bubble, right, as you're doing there. Uh, and so, but yeah, when I, I remember going, when I was in the Air Force in Japan, it, it was just like, I would go off base and now I'm in Japan. I'm going to get some ramen or some, some, some sushi or whatnot. But then um, when I went there to teach, suddenly it was just like, my neighbors are Japanese and I'm, there's crickets and there's no English television and I, I have to adapt quickly, you know, so. A very different experience. So, Well, I'll just chime in then. I think both of you have talked a lot about ESL as basically language teaching, and it's not necessarily a teaching degree. A lot of TESOL, Teachers of English to Speakers of Other Languages, that's a big program that you can get certified in, mm -hmm. but it's not the same as getting a, a degree in a certain subject and doing a certification in a U.S. or Canadian school or other school of education. Right, so it's a lot different. There's more time that you put into getting certified as a teacher in an international school than you do with the ESL. Another platform, and I talked about it today with a friend that's a teacher now, but another one is the Peace Corps for Americans. And both of those are great stepping stones into the commitment of international education as a certified teacher to get to those schools that we like to talk about. All right, let's take a moment for a little commercial about how to get in touch with us. You can, of course, find all four of us at the itpexpat.com. That's www.itpexpat.com. Or you could also find us at email at internationalteacherpodcast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Or if you're into Facebook, we have a new Facebook group at www.facebook.com slash groups slash ITP expat, where you can find all kinds of inside information about ITP expat. You can also find us on Instagram at ITP expats. That's with an S. ITP expats is our handle. All right. And thank you, listeners. We have over a hundred countries represented by our listeners. And though we're not monetized, we are here for you. And we would like to thank all of you for listening. So let's get back to the show. Jeff, tell us about your next school. Then. Did you go from, where did you go from China? Uh, well, I went to Beijing to Kuwait and then back to Shanghai for five years. Then, um, as I don't know, I kind of, I know it's weird because we were talking about Kuwait earlier. A lot of people don't like it. Kind of nothing happens there. It's kind of slow. But then the Arab Spring happened. And I was like, why am I in China? The Arab Spring is taking place. I should be in the Middle East where things are um, suddenly happening. 
Uh, when I was in Kuwait, I went. I was in um, a forensic speech and debate group, and we we took a trip to CAC. Uh, one year, my I think of my last year there, which is Egypt, uh, and it was really in, it was in Egypt in Cairo. Um, and I'd been to Egypt once before, on a, on my own personal trip, and I, I thought when I first visited, I thought, you know, I don't know if I don't want to live here because Cairo. I don't know if you've been to Cairo, but it's a really big city. I mean, it's just so vast, and you getting around takes forever. But then we were in this, uh, the, they call it the Mahdi bubble. Uh, it's this, it's where Cairo American College is. And so I visited there and it was like- It's a big neighborhood. It's a big neighborhood. Uh, my understanding, I've never been, but it, um, I've been to Cairo, but I haven't been to Mahdi. But it's a big, big neighborhood where you don't ever need to leave. Is that right? You've got all your supermarkets, yeah. your restaurants. Egypt, I mean, Egypt, well, most countries are kind of organized that way. You don't have to go very far in most countries, you know, because the things are, Right there, Mahdi's that way. There's a subway nearby. You can take taxis everywhere. But you, I mean, I could walk to school in five minutes and things like that. So um, it was a nice area. And also the, so what happened there was um, I had applied. I think my fourth year in Shanghai, they had an opening. You know, I was looking at Thai or search or whatever, but they had an opening at Cairo. I applied and I did an interview with. I went through the whole process with everybody. Uh, didn't get the job. Um, they ended up hiring the guy who was my HOD when I got there. But then they wrote me back in February that year, my fourth year, and they said, oh, we have another opening. Would you be interested in coming? And I was like, well, I just signed my new contract, you know, for another year. So I can't come this year. But the next year there was an opening uh, also, and it was it was a middle, was it middle school? I can't remember. No, it was another opening in the high school, high school, middle school. They, they didn't, they didn't specific, specify. But um, hmm. my principal at the time, my middle school principal, a man named Dan Kerr, which you may, you guys may know him from Principal's Training Center, he was one of my, I'd say he's one of my most important mentors in life, but he knew the principal there. They worked together in Jakarta. And I'm like, do you know this guy? You still, are you good friends? He's like, hey, I talked to him like once a week. And I'm like, well, there's this opening there. I'm interested <laughs> in applying. And he's like, let me, I'll write him right now. And then with 24 hours, I had an interview set up with this guy named Andy Ferguson and Courtney Bailey and people I, I didn't know, but it was like, I, in 48 hours, I had a job offer. And then I was back going back to Cairo or going to Cairo. So, uh, and so yeah, it was really, it was, it was very quick. It was, I think it was November or uh, that year. And so it was just before the job fairs and everything, it was just like, okay. So another contact, you know, just helped me get a job in Cairo. So, so I just want to clarify with all of these great stories about networking, mm -hmm. Jeff is a fantastic teacher. So if he wasn't a fantastic teacher to begin with, he wouldn't be getting these offers and these, you know, networking opportunities. The, the base has to be there, right? So he is a great teacher. Like you can hear the passion that comes out of him. You can hear the curiosity to learn. Like I'll, I'll say yes to economics, to TOK. But so without the base, he wouldn't be getting these job offers. But the network is huge, right? Networking in the international circuit is really big to getting those openings. Greg, what did you want to say? I spent a year in Cairo. I lived in Mahdi, which is the big bubble for expats, right. and had the best year of my life socially and living in Egypt in Cairo. I worked for a profit school at the okay. time, and it was crap for me. It was a not a good fit. Yeah. This is where I even came up with the idea of finding the right fit because I went through a year of hell at my school. Finding the right fit, www.amazon.com or wherever you buy your finer books. And then I left under the cover of night because I had yeah. a connection, mm -hmm. not under the cover of night. I'll Let me explain that in a second. But I had the worst <laughs> year uh, of school. No, I understand professionally for a year in Cairo, but I wasn't working at CAC. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work at, at CAC. I had maybe three years under my right. belt, and then I had my fourth year in Egypt, and it was horrible for me yeah. personally, not the right fit. Anyway, I left during the summer and broke my contract after first year uh -huh. because I had been networking with a friend that was a principal, Roberto, Santos, who has been on this show before, and he was the principal at the Dasma Mato School in Kuwait. Okay. So even with very little experience, because of strong networking and timing, I had a way out of a school that was not the right fit. I ended my contract at the summertime, so mm -hmm. I left and didn't return the next year. But on the you know while I was on the plane, basically wrote yeah. an email saying I'm not coming back. And yeah. the reason I did it that mm -hmm. way is because that school, the Prophet School, it had 
some clauses in the contract saying if you don't show up, we don't give you the second half of your summer pay. So it was one of those oh, schools right. that I wasn't prepared for that I didn't know. I was green, and mm-hmm. my fourth year, second school, I didn't know what to look for. And just a word of caution, always read your contract. Yeah. A red flag for me now has, oh, ever since then, has been if they hold your summer pay, your summer month pay, half or full, then I won't work for a school like that because there's reasons they do that to get you to come back, you know. I do have to shout out for a friend of mine, even a roommate for a whole year in Minneapolis after college, Dolly Shallaby, and she works at CAC still. A lot of people know her, and you, Jeff, know Dolly from the office personnel, I believe, at Cairo. Yeah, yeah, and Dolly and I, I mean, I knew her, I was there for eight years, and um, I taught, I, I don't know if I taught two of her daughters or one of her daughters, but uh, nice lady, I did, we had um, a friend of mine, a math teacher there, he set up a community theater, uh, second or third year I was there, and Dolly did a lot with uh, the activities and the arts, and so we'd worked together there, nice, really nice lady, and it's, as I say, small world, and you said you went to high school with her as well, right, so. JP is basically my boss and keeps track of my stories. JP, have I said <laughs> my story about finding Dolly in Cairo? Have I told that story online already? It's familiar, but not that familiar, so it means you probably only told it once. So go ahead. Okay, well, let me tell you, Jeff, it's really cool because when I first moved to Cairo, it had been many, many years since I had lived with her and another roommate in Minneapolis. She had gone back to Egypt. She's Egyptian. Her father and mother married her off at the time, so I lost contact with her. And when I went to Egypt, I got on the Internet to try and find Dolly. But I couldn't. I didn't know. She wasn't working at the schools back then. I knew that her father worked for AT&T in the 80s and 90s in that part of the world. And I was like, oh, my God. So I sent an email. Get this. I sent an email to at and <laughs> I swear to God, just at and wow. I sent him an email and said, listen, you know, Mr. Shalaby uh, used to be a VP for a, your company in the Middle East based out of uh, Cairo, I think. And I'm trying to get in touch with him. Could you please pass on my phone number? And believe it or not, her father sent me an email back and we chatted back and forth and he gave me permission and said, listen, don't expect her to call you back, but you can, here's her phone number. Just respect the fact that she's married now. We have a different culture and it's changed since then, right? But it was weird because I was out of my league there in a different culture. Like, how do I, should I even call her? And I worked up my, my nerve and said hi and that was the last time I talked with her. And then, I'd left her alone. I didn't want to cause any problems with family. And she wasn't in our school systems at all back then. So I'm glad you got to know her. And thanks for letting me tell the story again. (laughs) Well, I'm thinking that email goes out. You certainly don't (laughs) want to say, hi, I want to contact this VP because I want to talk to his daughter. No, but I... (laughs) That wouldn't go over very well. Her parents came over for graduation from college, from Egypt. Mm -hmm. And they were at the graduation. And my parents and her parents got along great we're buddies and then after graduation we lived together for another year her father knew exactly who i was and i was harmless mm. and you know we were good friends at the time back in college you were greg the single I guy know, back yeah it was great but yeah. Yeah, looking back i'm like i can't believe they did that <laughs> no, it's, it's like I, I think i mentioned earlier like a, a, a colleague of mine now a friend of mine here music teacher young brazilian guy he actually went to school at cac as well i think second or third grade and so we we're talking about. I was talking about my experience. He's like, "You're in Cairo." I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "I live there too." And I'm like, "It was so. It's such a small place, right?" So, that was a student of yours. Well, no, he's actually one of my, one of our music teachers at um, at the American School here in Rio. Uh, but he went to school at um, CAC. His dad was there a long time ago in the eight. Uh, I'm not 80s. He's on 29. So, in the the zeros, whatever they call them, the 2000s. So. Uh, okay, so we're gonna get back on track here. So. <laughs> Because <laughs> Back I, to I've loved, I loved all the tangents. The tangents have been awesome, but we haven't got to where Jeff is now, and I don't know if there's something in between. So you're at Cairo American Cairo College American in Egypt. In Egypt for, I was there for eight years. Um, wonderful place. I mean, I would say I don't, I don't want to rank international schools, but it was, it was one of the better ones with facility, with the, the management, with the support from the administration, also from all the support staff. Um, 
I think it's like the mod for me. It's always like I remember I was telling someone the other day, I had a problem when my, my refrigerator caught on fire, like my seventh year or something there. And like it, it, <laughs> no, there was no damage, but it burned out. And so I, I send an email to maintenance. I'm like, my refrigerator is on fire. It's not working. And within like two hours, they were knocking on my door, bringing me a brand new refrigerator. I mean, this is uh, the, the support they give you. And it, I never experienced that at other international schools. And so. Um, I remember when I was in Beijing, I had in my apartment, I had this rinky dink little apartment with, it was just no heat and like no, it was all concrete flooring. And, and I had these, I had these light bulbs that were, they were an, an, antique light bulbs. And I went, one of them blew out and I took it to my boss and said, where do I buy these? And he's like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen these light bulbs since the seventies. Right? So it's like, it's like from the <laughs> cultural evolution or something. So he's like, I think you can find them at this Russian market. So I literally was walking around in Beijing looking for light bulbs. Uh, but yeah, they, they didn't help us as much there, but yeah, CAC was really, really good. But it, it, it goes back to another connection. I, um, I, my, my eighth year there, I wasn't even thinking of leaving. It was, you know, it was one of those things you're just, you kind of, it's September, you're enjoying your time. And I was really enjoying, I mean, I was a great place. I was, I was having a great time at school, but, but a principal from my school in Shanghai, who I didn't know, we had, I said, we had a couple of campuses. He sent me an email out of the blue and he said, oh, I was talking to, back to Dan Kerr. I was talking about Dan earlier. He's like, I was talking to Dan. I was looking for a, I'm looking for a history teacher at Carol Morgan in the Dominican Republic. Uh, would you be interested in interviewing? And I said, he's like, I never met you, but Dan says good things about you. I said, okay, great, sir. I, th I always tell people, never turn down an interview um, it, it, because mm -hmm. you never know what it leads to, right? But, um, but I did an interview with him. It was a great interview. I thought after the interview, I was like, this is the person I really want to work for. Um, and, um, but I didn't get the job because, you know, they ended up hiring someone else, which is normal. But I, I guess at the point I started thinking about other um, other opportunities in Latin America because I've always wanted to kind of see different parts of the world. Travel and, bug. And, but after eight years in Egypt, I mean, Egypt was great, but I think maybe it's COVID kind of shut everything down because, um, you know, in, when I was in Egypt, I would go to Europe every summer. Uh, I mean, I sent, I, I visited so many different countries and it was just great. I had the best time, but then COVID kind of like, okay, and now I'm here. What's, I, I want to, as you said, travel bug, I want to get out and see the world a bit. And so I, my assistant principal there at the time, she was she'd lived in Rio. She was she was here at the school where I am now. And then a friend of mine in um, he's in American School of Paris now, but I taught one in Shanghai. He's like, uh, I wrote him and said, There's an opening at EARJ, the American School in Rio de Janeiro. He said he said, Oh, let me write the head of school or the head of the department for you and tell you tell her about you. And then I so I had, I interviewed here <laughs> and I interviewed for a couple other schools in, in Brazil. I was looking at other schools in Latin America as well, like in Colombia and Argentina, but but I never, it never really got very far with those. But, um, but then, yeah, I was offered a job here. And with, when I got here, the, the, when, I, when I interviewed here, the head of school, um, he, we were talking, because it was really funny, when I, when I saw his name, I said, I went through some old emails, and I'm like, I applied for a job when he was the head of school in Khartoum. There's a, a Khartoum International Community School. And so, in, in Sudan, Sudan, because I, when I was living in Kuwait, I was thinking about looking at different places, and he was at the, he was the first head of school there, I believe. So, um, but then I was talking to uh, in, during the interview. He's like, "You taught in Egypt and Kuwait, and our our student body is very similar in some ways. You know, it's like the richest part of the society. The kids work, but the, you know, you have to push them a little bit. You know, so there's this. We probably all experienced this that." You know, there's different types of students, and so he thought, based on your experience in the Middle East, I think you would like fit in really well in Latin America. And I thought, well, that's good, and it has been a very similar experience. I, I thought, um, like you're saying, Greg, after one year in Egypt, you you quit. But I always tell people, I kind of tell the young teachers, I mean, the first year is kind of tough wherever you go. It's the second year where it's like the gravy, right? It's the it's the good things because you you figured out the culture a bit, you know the school dynamic. So I I, I I've kind of always approached. The first year is, is going to be a rough year. It's no, it's never going to be perfect. So, uh, but the second year is where it gets good. And, and so this, when I first came here, it was a tough transition because I, you know, miss all your friends. You miss what you're doing in Egypt, uh, and then suddenly you're in a new culture. And so it takes a while to to get your uh, sea legs, I guess you say. So, yeah, and and I want to just, I want to piggyback on that for a second there, and my situation was dire it was no, like no. it was not even social it was not the fact that i was living somewhere i wasn't comfortable in your case it, it sounds like you liked your job and you were trying to it was a tough year to get yeah. used to transitioning for that but for me it was professional 
Yeah. And it just was against everything that I believed. Like I was being asked to do things mm-hmm. in my educational, professional life I would have never done yeah. without having been told I had to do it, etc. So for you, I'm glad it was a, a, I agree with you. The second year is always better. In my opinion, it's always better to stay and the third and the fourth are even better, you know? Yeah. And it's great that you've stayed at your school so many times because if you, if you have the unfortunate experience like I did of leaving after a year, it, it's a big black flag yeah. on your, or red flag on your resume that you will it will follow you for the rest of your yeah. life and they they ask you questions about it. you're talking about the difference between profit schools i mean we mentioned earlier because like AI, as kuwait was a profit school shanghai community were profit schools but i think not all profit for profit schools work the same way i mean some really put a lot back into it i was kind of lucky I, we had owners who obviously made money but they did they did invest a lot in the schools and the quality of education things like that so i think i got lucky but i know what you're saying yeah just to clarify there are for profit schools that will still reinvest some of their profits back into the school into into salaries into benefits into materials and then there are other prop for profit schools that will siphon off almost all the tuition money into the owners pockets so yeah that's what you're talking about yeah, right yeah i mean so Either one of those, it was me individually that I had a really bad year that just didn't work out. So no, mine's no, like a, yeah, mine's like a an outlier, right? So for our no, listeners, no, I, I, just I, I definitely agree year. with you. I mean, but even some of the, like when I was in uh, both Kuwait and Shanghai, we had we had teachers leave their first year. Like you know, even one couple fled. I mean, actually, I have couples flee both schools early on. I'm like, uh, but you have to adapt. I mean, uh, CC, we lost teachers the same way. We, people didn't come back after their first year, second year, um, just left the school. So crazy. Uh, yeah. it, it happens, but I think if you're really, um, it's, as you say earlier, it's, it's important to find a, a good uh, fit for, for a teacher um, at a certain school. And a lot of, as you say, a lot of for-profit schools, like the, the academy I worked for in Korea, it seemed just about money. And we, like they would fail students who were really good, so they wanted to do the lesson again. I'm like, it doesn't seem, it, I mean, it's not a. This is not a career I want to be in, right? So, uh, but yeah, we, you have to be careful. You have to be careful out there. So. so, Jeff, one of Greg's favorite topics in the world is job fairs. Okay. So, can you tell us? Did you ever get to a job fair? Because of all these networking opportunities, it sounds like maybe not. I like have, maybe one or I've two in your to, whole career. Let me say two. I've been to three. That's crazy. I went to ISS, the International School Services, in '99. I mentioned that was in Boston. I was. I was so prepared. I mean, I made all these beautiful resumes. I had all of my work and I got there and I think I had two interviews. Uh, I'm still trying to, I came close to getting a job. I, I had uh, I had an interview with, um, I had, a, I think, Monkiara in KL. They wanted to interview me, mm. which I was really excited. because I, I, Malaysia. Malaysia I, I thought this would be great going back to Asia. And when I got to the interview, they told me, oh, sorry, we already hired somebody. I'm like, ah. And then yeah. I had the, I don't know if it's American School or International, I think it's the International School of Islamabad in Pakistan. They were interested in me. Ooh. And of course, I, Rose Puffer. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know much about the school, but. She's been there for like 30 years, so I know that that was the head of school, I'm it sure. Was, it looked like a really good position. The, the woman who was teaching history was leaving, and the, but the interviewer said, she may stay. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you know, we're really interested in candidacy, whatever. And I, I was really excited. And I remember, I still remember this question. They said, are there any questions you'd like to ask about the school? And I said, if I come to Pakistan, can I learn how to play cricket? That's all I want to learn how to do. And I thought, it's like, yeah, our kids <laughs> love cricket. They'd love it. You play on the pitch and stuff. And so, but then a couple of weeks later, they wrote back and said, oh, by the way, uh, she's decided to stay. So that was that, my first experience. The second experience, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, I went, I was in Beijing. I went to K- Kuala Lumpur for their December job fair. Mm. Um, and it was kind of, it was one of those, job fairs sometimes are great, but a lot of times early they want to hire science and math, special education, things like that. Couples, they love couples. I went there, I, I walked in, I had a little name tag, I, remember, I still remember this. This is the funniest interview I had. And there was just two guys ran up to me from a school in Riyadh, a boys school in Riyadh. And they're like, oh, Jeff Lindstrom. I was like, yes. And I said, um, we want to interview you for a job at our school. And I said, oh, I was so excited. And I said, oh, yeah, so what kind of school is it? They're like, oh, we're a boys' school in Riyadh. And I said, awesome, what's the position for? They're like, a fifth grade or fifth or fourth or fifth grade math and science. And I'm like, well, 
I said, well, I'm a, I'm a social studies and English. I was doing English at the time. Social studies and English teacher's like, oh, no, it doesn't matter. And I said, okay. And I said, um, and then I got, But you said yes to the interview because well, you always say to yes him, to but, interviews, well, right? We didn't really give much of the interview praise, but I, I talked to him and I said, um, will I like the school? Is it a nice school? They're like, oh, no. They were so honest. They said, no, no, the school's horrible. They, the kids will treat you horrible. <laughs> And I said, you shouldn't have sent out these guys. Like, like these guys are the worst interviewers I've ever seen. I mean, they were nice guys, but, but, but then I was like, I said, oh well, because uh, I was in China, you know, you can meet people and stuff. I said, well, in Saudi, can I like meet the locals? Do they, is it, because I'm interested in learning about Arab culture and Islam stuff. They're like, oh no, the locals, they stay to themselves. They hate foreigners. And I said, okay. <laughs> No, but they're really Absolutely. selling yeah, the school. But, but the caveat, the, the, the closer was, it's like almost a per- perfect comedy routine. They said, oh, but there's a hospital nearby. I said, okay. And they said, it's full of Filipino nurses. Like they're, oh, like they're no. They're showing the fact that you can date Filipino nurses. I'm like, I, I don't mind nothing against Filipino nurses, but I'm like, it didn't seem like a... It didn't seem like the right fit for me at the time. Um, <laughs> didn't seem like the whole reason you would go to a country and accept a job is for your yeah. dating but I life. I think that was the only interview I had. That I wow. think that was the only interview I had at the entire. Maybe I did one or two, but um, but then I went. As I mentioned earlier, I went to the London Fair, the IB Fair, and um, I did an interview. This woman, Noreen Hawley, she was at AIS Kuwait, and she was looking for a high school teacher. So I interviewed her, and then. I ran into her at the party, you know, you go to the party at night, so I ran into her again, and she's like, do you also teach middle school? And I said, oh yeah, I'm doing middle school and high school right now. Um, she's like, oh, okay, because the mm-hmm. high school position, they closed it already. I said, okay. And I didn't think anything about it, and she's like, why don't you come by tomorrow, we'll do an interview. And I thought, okay, we'll do another interview, talk about middle school. And like, she offered me a contract, like, here's a contract, um, would you be interested? And I said, wow. I said, can I... Um, can I, can I have like 24 hours think about it? <laughs> Take a second. And she's like, yeah, sure. And what kind of hospital do you have? <laughs> Filipinos at the hospital. But, uh, but a friend of mine, <laughs> but I had a couple of friends who, women friends, because you always, um, I, I was asking them about life in the Middle East. They're like, oh, it's great. You'll love it. So uh, I thought, yeah, sure, why not? Um, mm. Try something new. But then I was, at, one interview I had at that fair, it was kind of an off-the-cuff interview. In uh, there's a couple, I, I shouldn't, I, I don't want to mention the school because the guy is still there, I believe, but there was this one interviewer for a job, and he, because I don't know if you remember, the, we used to go to the hotel rooms and sit, you know, sit in a big chair, and the guy was sitting on in the, the bed. bedroom. And yes. this guy was a smoker. Ugh. This guy was a smoker, and he was smoking during the interview, and he would ask me questions Ooh. like, and I've talked to people who work for him, and they're like, oh, he's still the same way, but I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to mention the school, but he, um, he would ask questions like, what do you think about classroom management? And then he would lean in and like get really close to your face. And then he would lean back and he answered. And he did that every question. And I was just like, I was so, at the end of the interview, I was like, man, I hope I don't get a second interview. And then the next day, <laughs> and the next day in my mailbox, you know, get a little mailbox, there was a thing there saying, oh, thanks, but no thanks. I was like, oh, thank goodness. Uh, I didn't really want that job, but it's a great school, though. I don't want to say the name of school, but that brings up a good point for our inner, our our international and national uh, mm-hmm. listeners. You know, anybody that hasn't been to a job fair overseas yet, some of these job fairs are in hotels, and then some of the interviews are being held in the head of school's hotel yeah. room. So they have the chairs set up outside, and you are asked to show up maybe five, 10 minutes before your interview in case things are running fast, but it's always the opposite, I found. Things were running slow. And at the time of your interview, you were supposed to knock on the door, just nice and polite, just a little knock on the door saying you're there, but you wait on the chair. And then they will eventually open the door, the person will leave and you will go into the hotel room and there's the bed. And I mean, we've heard it on on this show, right, Greg? Where sometimes that bed is like still unmade. <laughs> You're like, oh, I yeah. like you didn't want to make your bed before I came into this room. Like, oh my gosh, cringe. You want to hear some stories, man? You just my first book, and I, I mean, I don't always promote that one, but my first book, 
is definitely finding the right fit. That is, is definitely got some stories about my first job fair where I carried everything with me and I'm going up to the hotel room like la- just before. I'm sweating bullets. I drop half the papers in the hallway. Mm. I look like total crap. I mean, I didn't know how it worked. And you're like, oh, my God, the stories. Mm. But then after you do a couple of these job fairs, you get used to it. You understand how the process works etc right jeff so what about uh the next one you're going to talk about your friend from namibia oh yeah no i met this guy in the elevator we're just in the elevator he was the he was the director in nguyen hook i think i I don't know much about this i've heard it's a good school but i noticed he was looking for like social studies and like business studies or whatever and i said oh i said um you have an opening now and he's like oh yeah you want to do an interview and so i like literally interviewed him for like five floors and he's like yeah you probably wouldn't be a good fit since you don't have a background (laughs) in business i'm like but I was like, that's cool. Good luck. But he sent, it was just a little thing. You know, you just talk to people. I always say, always go to the party. I always tell new people, I said, always mm. stay at the hotel. I don't care what you do. Stay at the hotel. Don't save money. Uh, it's not worth it. But I would like to interject the budget and semi-retired at 49 <laughs> years old person over crazy. here. One of the reasons I never stayed at the job fair hotel was because of cost. And um, the cost was really through the roof. But here's the thing, I would stay down the road and walk and stay the entire day. So it was like I was staying at the hotel, just I didn't have the comfort of a bed and a shower and whatever midway through the the day, but I would not leave. So I would get there at whatever time in the morning it opens, you know, seven, eight, and I would stay till sometimes midnight at the hotel the entire day. And then I would go home, go back to my cheap hotel to sleep. So you can do it on a budget. You can do it without staying at the hotel, but you have to be committed and know that you're going to spend the entire day at the job fair hotel. Exactly. When I went to ISS, I was staying with friends in Boston, and they were out in Brookline. And so I remember, I remember leaving the fair, getting back to their place, and they, this before cell phones really. And they said, "Oh, someone from some school called and wanted to interview with you." I'm like, "Ah, now I have to go back to." the Boston city and then look for the person's name and everything. So, um, I may have missed my perfect job, but you never know. So, but you're right. It is expensive. The hotels typically are, you're talking $150, $200 a night. And, um, well, and that was back in the nineties. I mean, now I would think it's a lot closer to 300 bucks a night. So yeah, you can definitely do it on a budget, but just be prepared to spend the entire day at the job fair, you know, and, and, maybe bring a change of underwear or something so you can feel fresh for the evening parties because you're right you want to attend everything you want to go to the presentations you want to go to the cocktail hour Mm -hmm. you want to network that is one of the points of in-face job fairs is the ability to get to talk to people i know greg loves that aspect right greg with the you know talking to people about where you've been, where you're going. You can find so many commonalities. If you're listening to this and you haven't read my book, which we always make fun of, right? You know, finding the right fit. (laughs) But it does walk you through one of the job fairs. And the only thing that's changed since I wrote that book in 2020 was the fact, is the fact that now everything's on digital. So all of your little thank you notes. I mean, I still take thank you notes, but your signups and your interview process and all of the paperwork for the job fair and the database, everything's online and on apps now. There's no more file folders. They don't use file folders. I call them mailboxes. Those are all gone after COVID. So everything went digital. A lot more interviews are being held in the conference center rooms now because they realize it may not be the best to be up in the hotel rooms after yeah. years of doing this. They have started to mix it up. I think a after bit. the Me Too, yeah, right. Me Too movement, they were like, maybe we shouldn't ask single women yeah. to enter a man's bedroom. Or like, <laughs> whoever thought of they're that system. They're still doing that, but not as much, and they're offering more choices and leaving it sort of up to them. So I I tell you what, and I can't say it enough, I love the book that I wrote about. I've been to six job fairs, and I've written about them, and they're fantastic. And you're right, it's a networking opportunity which you never get. And face-to-face is always better. I think they're some of the best experiences. I mean, I uh, even if you don't get... It's better when you get a job, of course, but, um, but just meeting people from different schools, talking to people about their experiences... I wasn't really looking this year, but I'm looking. A friend sent me a list of all the schools, you know, where you can get a job over 60. And so 
I'm approaching that quickly, mm-hmm. but um, I have a feeling I might have to do another job fair at the end of my career because you know they they just don't they're, I'm not they're, they're not discriminating necessarily, but they want people to you know younger people maybe so. Um, Jeff, if only you knew somebody that was able to help you with your job search. I don't well, I know, gonna, Greg. I was going to ask Greg you know? about it since you wrote a book about it. So, uh, oh, there's a chafing man. Oh my. I know somebody that works and helps with CVs. Uh, I right. think it's something like JP Mint Consulting. Okay, I think. I'll check You them definitely out. have to get in touch <laughs> with her. I'll see if yeah. I can find their website here. So, no. You know, it's <laughs> funny, you know, Jackie, when we met at um, in Selsden, right? And, and I thought, you know, that would be a perfect place for a job fair at that hotel. In Surrey? You know, like, because, I mean, think about it. You've got the golf course there. Oh, Imagine having, oh, like, yes. a surge or actual... ISS there. It would be such a wonderful place to stay. Your hotel's really nice. You've got the grounds. You've got the bar down the street. You've got the Indian restaurant. You know, you have... I still find it kind of small, it's though. It's small, kind of small. It's like the... Community. Yeah. yeah. And plus, you have, like... Yeah, that was a The beautiful... cities are changing for uh-huh. these job fairs, and they're happening all year round. Yeah. So let's put in a plug for the job fairs. The face-to-faces are the big ones like ISS and Search, and then you have you and I in in Northern Iowa. Uh, There are places, there are so many cities that they're in now. They're in the Middle East, they're in Southeast Asia, they're in the United States, in Canada. They're all over the world, and get online and start looking for that. Our website hosts some of the information, definitely. You know, we've been talking about everything on this episode. And we got into one of my favorite topics, <laughs> right? This whole passion. I love job fairs. But boy, I've ex- I've been excited about this whole thing. Jeff's been on here so long, his computer's about to die. That's okay. Right? And we <laughs> talked about so many great schools, and you're, you're getting into the age limits and stuff, which we haven't even touched on. Yeah. And we need to do a... I want to invite you back, Jeff, because sure. we need to have... We need to have like a panel discussion with some of us that are reaching 60 or getting, you know, in our mid 50s, et cetera. And I think we've been asked about that. So I want to spend more time talking about Kentucky Fried Chicken, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by Kentucky <laughs> Fried Chicken. <laughs> you know, it's weird. My apartment in Brazil has the strangest plugs sometimes, and you have to kind of find one. Fortunately, it's not a video podcast. So now I'm sitting in my other bedroom. Now it's charging. So, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So, Jeff, we are, uh, as Greg has pointed out, we are approaching, fast approaching, the end of our our uh, time with you, though we've loved it. And I, I for one, have just found the, the time has gone by so quickly. I'd like to ask you one of our two questions that we ask our interview okay. uh, interviewees. And one of them is... Do you have a police story for us? When I was in the Air Force, Air Force or International School, because I was in the Air Force, I had a, a kind of police story. Anything. When I was, um, I was stationed in Japan, in northern Japan, and this was in 87. And in the library, there was the magazine Soviet Life. I don't remember Soviet Life. And I used to look at it all the <laughs> okay. time. And it was really cheap. You could subscribe to it, like a lifetime subscription for like 30 bucks or something. And I thought, I mean, I was at the time I was thinking about doing State Department or something like that at some point, you know. So, um, and the Cold War was going on and it was never going to end. Of course, it ended a couple years later. But um, I subscribed to it and then I, I moved to Texas. I was stationed in Texas um, and I was house sitting for a friend of mine who was, she was married, a married woman I worked with. And so I was living in a dormitory. So she let me stay in her place for a couple of weeks while they were on vacation. So, but then it's like eight in the morning, there's a knock on my door. It's these two police officers, uh, military police. And they're like, are you Sergeant Lindstrom? I'm like, yeah, that's my name. And they're like, uh, you need to come with us. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? And so they take me to this room and they're like, we've been told that you've been in contact with the Soviet Union. And I'm like, Soviet Union? <laughs> and they're like, and you haven't reported it to the base commander. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, you have a, do you have a subscription to Soviet Life magazine? I'm like, yeah, it's such a library. I mean, so, and then they asked me all these other questions about my career plans and stuff like that. So they're like, oh, okay, we'll let you off. So that was, that's my police story there, I guess. Um, I have, I have others, I have one, well, I don't, it's, I've heard of, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. We have to unpack this. So this was in 1987. Well, the Japan, I You're, mean, that was in Japan, but in Texas, it was probably 90, 1990, right towards the end of the Cold War. 
God. And then it was like, are you a member? 1990, they're bringing you yeah. in for questioning for Isn't having that, ties to the Soviet, Soviet Union. Yeah, so, uh, it's Texas. It's Texas, yeah. <laughs> that explains Soviet everything. Soviet. Soviet. It's Soviet. It's Soviet, yeah. So, um, wow. Yeah, so it was a different time, I guess. So, um, It's like a joke. <laughs> yeah, that's my only story. I had a student once get arrested. Well, I've had a couple students, actually. Um, one case was in Kuwait. We had... It was a really strange case. I don't know the kids. I think it was Jordanian. Oops, I'm running out. Batteries about to out. Uh, oh no! I've already plugged in my computer. It's not. Sorry. Um, this is like a joke. There's a Jordanian kid in in Kuwait. That gets... yeah, in Kuwait. <laughs> Walks into a bar. Yeah, was, oh wait, um, there are no bars in he Kuwait. Was, he was <laughs> caught with drugs or something. I remember that. And it was. Um, we didn't. I don't know if we reported to the government or not. There was a big issue because uh, the whole thing is if they reported him. He would be arrested, first of all, and then his parents would be kicked out of the country. So it was kind of, they don't, the Kuwaitis didn't play mm -hmm. around. And so I think it was, it was dealt with within the school internally, and then the kid went back to, basically he left the country, went back to Jordan to stay with his uncle or something, mm -hmm. and that was the whole case. But, but I noticed that internationally you have to be somewhat careful when you're dealing with the police, of course, and at the same time, you don't want to destroy an entire family. <laughs> Uh, their finances just because a kid makes a mistake. So I think uh, a lot of schools, especially a teenager, I think a lot of schools have to deal lightly. with those situations differently, right? So obviously he couldn't be at our school anymore, but at the same time, we don't want to destroy mm -hmm. his parents it's in the process. So, but yeah, I think that's what you have to deal with internationally. But okay, question number two, oh, two is: okay. You've traveled all over the world, and you've mm -hmm. been to many different schools. Okay. So we like to ask you three things that you normally take with you when you travel, when you go to live somewhere else? Oh, three things I carry. Um, I used to tell people, the, the, the number one thing you want to take with you wherever you go in the world is a sense of humor. Number one thing. Uh, the other thing I wish I'd have brought when I came here, it, I used to I always bring a coffee mug, or some kind of coffee mug, you have to have it. When I came to Brazil, I, I had all this tea in Egypt, and I thought, oh, I'll just buy tea when I come to Brazil. And now there's no hard, it's hard to find tea here. It's not as available as you think. So I wish I'd have brought tea. I actually brought tea to China. When I moved to China in 2001, I brought tea to China uh, <laughs> because I always thought, well, I don't know if they had coffee in 2001. I don't know. So I'm going to bring some tea. Uh, little things like that you want. Um, <laughs> a little snack or so. Like, I wish I had some Twizzlers as well. Um, I wish I brought a bag of Twizzlers. <laughs> a, a student of mine recently made me a kind of a graduation poster where he put all these American candy bars on it saying, you know, how much he liked me and whatnot. But he, his parents work at the embassy, so they have access to the commissary. But little things like that are nice to comfort to foods. Get. Right. When I when I my first year in Japan, I remember I was living there, and I got a package in the mail, and from a friend of mine in Tennessee, and I was like, "What is this package? It's a huge, heavy package." And I opened it up, and she sent me through the mail a 12 pack of Dr Pepper, and I was just so happy. It was such a great Christmas present, but um, wow. just little things like creature comforts from home. I don't know, other things like, when I moved here, I mean, I don't know if it was because of COVID or Brazil has such high tariffs, but the shipping would have been just astronomical to move here. And so I ended up mm. losing most, I mean, I left a lot of stuff in Egypt, gave a lot to friends, uh, gave all, donated all my books to the library and things like that. Um, but um, I don't know. I, the more I move around, the, the less I want to have because it's such a pain to to move stuff, right? So and you uh, haven't moved around so. that much, Jeff. Just to clarify, in a almost thirty year or twenty something year career, I I heard what six schools or something. Like you haven't moved around that much. Our discussion has just gone so many different yeah. directions. Two I got years lost. in Beijing, and then I, I, actually I think in the '90s I moved around a bit. I, when I was, um, I remember when I left Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, in 93, 96, I went back to the States. Then I moved to Korea. Then I moved back to the States. Then I moved back to Japan for a bit. Then I moved to Boston. And then I moved to Beijing. And I was like, I think when I, when I left Beijing, I was just exhausted of moving all the time. Uh, I kind of still have a recurring mm -hmm. nightmare about packing. It's my number one nightmare. Um, I hate packing so much. And um, But then when I got to Kuwait, I mean, we talked earlier, a lot of people don't like Kuwait, but I think after a couple of years, it, I got into the groove and I just really liked it. When I left there, I felt I felt kind of devastated after six years. I'm like, how could I leave this place? I've had so many friends here, it's such a nice place. And then 
Then I went to Shanghai. I was, I was surprised I actually stayed in Shanghai less than Kuwait. I stayed five years there. Egypt, you know, I, CEC was a great school. I, I actually could see myself retiring at CEC, but that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. I thought about maybe leaving because I didn't really just necessarily retire there. I'd like to see more of the world. And so, but I'm hoping, I mean, I just signed for two more years here. Um, Rio, I don't know, our school has a six year limit supposedly for expat hires. And so, oh. but other schools in Brazil are their options. So, so I probably, I'll, I'll probably right now, I'll probably do six years here if they'll, if they let me, if they want me to offer me a new contract. And then. Did you see that uh, the superintendent at Graded uh, in Brazil, mm -hmm. there in Brazil, one of the top schools in the world, is Jane McGee coming in from Vietnam? Did no, you I see haven't. that? That's interesting. That, yeah, Network, and I have yeah. friends at Graded, and I, I wrote them awesome. a little congratulations. You're scoring like a fantastic yeah. head of school. I don't know Jane personally, but I've I've followed her, uh, always wanting to work with her if I ever had the chance. So, so who yeah. knows? Maybe you'll meet at some kind of. Do you have little functions that, where you can kind of meet the other you know, schools? Uh, this year we had we I don't know we had a really strange year because we lost our spring break. We had to. Uh, Brazilian law, it's illegal to work in January as a teacher, uh, but we've been working in January for our PD, like the last week of January, we always do a week of PD before the second semester. But this year we lost it, I guess they really enforced the law, so they had to take away our spring break. And I think that was at the time they were doing the international teachers, or the local teachers fair in Paraguay this year, and I was really hoping to go to that. So. Uh, maybe next year I'll try to go, but I have a, I have a few friends that graded. Um, uh, there are lots of like there's so many schools in in Rio and and I'm not Rio, but all throughout Brazil. So um, lots of opportunity. So if I do end up staying here for six years, I, I'm sure I'll be using JP Mint for. So for Greg, books, it sounds so. like we've got a. Greg, it sounds like we've got to plan a little trip to Brazil, a little reunion, ITP reunion. Jeff, you can recommend some places where we can go and stay. And then, Jeff, you also know that you are free and welcome to stay right here in Querétaro, Mexico, whenever you have a little break. Because I do know you travel a lot on your breaks. I, I've always been so interested in your Facebook posts of where your, you know, where your travels are. Yeah, it is, it's the lucky part of our job, I think, you know, getting to see the world, so. Speaking of that, uh, Facebook, uh, Jeff, are there any, is there any social media that our listeners can follow you on or a website or anything that you'd like to uh, share? I'm on, I'm on, I mean, I'm on Facebook and Instagram whatnot. Um, I have no, I do not have an OnlyFans account, which is good. I, I don't think that is <laughs> Uh, that went somewhere that I didn't expect. Well, what about LinkedIn? Uh, Can they find I you on LinkedIn? LinkedIn? I just don't know what my uh, LinkedIn account is. It's Jeff Lindstrom, Jeffrey Lindstrom, whatever. But uh, you can find me there. I'm all <laughs> over. Um, I don't do much on social media anymore. I think it, as many people are aware of, it got it's gotten pretty ugly in the last couple of years. Um, I think it they can find States, you through our website then, you right? You can find us here. Yeah, they can they can contact us. Yeah, anybody have they can contact us at international teacher podcast at gmail dot com and we can pass it along Happy to, to Jeff. I, a friend of mine, a friend of a friend of mine, just wrote me the other day from Kuwait. She's looking for a job in Brazil in the next couple of years, and I said, yeah, let's, let's hook up and I'll tell you all about the experiences here. So, I, as you, I think you said earlier, I think it was Gregor, uh, Jackie said in an early podcast that we are a small school district in many ways, and so. You work, we work together, we know people, we help people. So that's what we do. Jeff, how about a few last words, final um, words of wisdom from such a uh, well-traveled and uh, experienced teacher overseas? I say, I don't know, maybe embrace the cultural differences. I mean, everyone is not from North America. Uh, they have their own way of doing things. Um, Try lots of new food. Um, I always say, when I live in Japan, I said, you can wash down anything with beer or tea, okay? If it's the grossest sushi you've ever had, you can wash it down quickly. If it's like raw liver, which I had once in Japan, you can wash it down with tea or beer. Um, try try to learn, <laughs> I mean, language is important. Try to try your best. I'm, I'm terrible at language, but I always found that when you approach the locals in any country using their language, or at least trying, they do really appreciate it. Um, Try to get to know your kids better. I think um, I think we often approach education. It has to be this certain way, and it doesn't really have to be. There's all kinds of ways to explore education. Be prepared to be frustrated. There's going to be a lot of that along the way. But you know, it's just be flexible, adapt, 
the world is an amazing place. I mean, see, I, I, one bit of advice I always give new teachers, and they never listen to me, is I always say, don't go home your first vacation. Don't go home in December. What? Don't go home in the summer. Because oh December no, okay I thought you meant even the summer. that I always say the first year stay away see something see something else because that mm. there's that pattern I used to do it go home go back to your work go home go back to work mm. like I'm in South America now like last year I went to Ecuador and uh, Peru this year I've already planned my December break going to Colombia and Ecuador you want to see family you want to see friends but that first couple of years just explore see the world then go home when you when you feel the need but at the same time I would say try your best to experience the world outside of your comfort zone. So, All right. Final words, JP? Well, I just want to thank Jeff for responding to my many, many messages to come on to the show. He finally did. Woohoo! Right, and perseverance is the key. But I want to really thank you for your time. It's been amazing reconnecting. Greg, any th- final thoughts? I admire having Jeff on our show, and he's got some great input for our listeners. And I just want to say thank you to our listeners once again from the International Teacher Podcast. You can find Jeff Lindstrom down in South America, down in Rio de Janeiro, but you won't find him in Riyadh at the hospital. (laughs) We are brought to you by KFC, and that's what Jeff wants us to know. Uh, JP Mint from JP Mint Consulting, and I am Greg the Single Guy coming to you from my apartment. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next episode.